Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to Karen Community live stream. Uh, just to have a that was a great song, by the way. If you you uh, logged in a little bit early, uh, when he called us out of that grave, praise the Lord. Uh, just a couple points um, for you to consider. If you have questions based on um, any of the things online on this message, you can email me at Pastor Pat P A S T O R P A T at Caring Church C A R I N G C H U R C H dot org. That's my email address, and uh, I can get back to you and answer to the best of my ability questions you might have uh, on the message or, or anything else. So you can contact me, Pastor Pat, at caringchurch.org. As we're praying today, uh, to start, I want to pray certainly for um, those in the government that have to make the decisions that they're making, trying to guide us through this time. I want to pray for the victims, those who have lost loved ones and are grieving, we want to pray um, for our medical workers. They are you know, extremely, extremely taxed, our EMT workers, all of our first responders. Now, we want to remember to pray for our truckers. Uh, <clears throat> they are working you know, a lot of overtime. Uh, they're pressed and they're doing a great job. You know the saying, if you got it, a truck brought it. So we've got the truckers out driving and delivering goods and, and keeping us supplied. And that's a crucial part of our whole infrastructure. So pray for them. And then something I was reading last night on World News Group, one of the ripple effects of the travel restrictions is that adoptions have effectively shut down across the world. So there are people that are waiting, children are waiting to be adopted and the parents, the adoptive parents can't go and travel. And there are even accounts where people have traveled, they have the child, but they can't travel back. So they're stuck in the country somewhere with this child that they've adopted or children and they can't get back. So I had never even thought of that, but that's just part of the ongoing ripple effect of what's happening with the travel restrictions. So plenty to pray for, to pray for one another, to pray for our neighbors, our families. So let's do that. Let's go to the Lord. Let's pray. And then we'll jump into God's word and see what he has in store for us for this Sunday. Let's pray together. God, thank you that you are on the throne. We talked about that last week, and it's true whether we talked about it last week or not. You are sovereign. You are in total control, and uh, we need that to be true. God, we pray for those who are in authority over us, who have positions of authority in the government, and are they are struggling, and they're trying to make the best decisions, and it is very challenging. We pray, God, that you give them wisdom, wisdom to be able to decipher all of the information that they're flooded with and make the best decision you know what's best for us as a people, as a world, that we are yours. Scripture says everything belongs to you, even us. And so you know what is best in this time, what you're trying to accomplish. God, we pray for the medical workers. We pray for the first responders. They need supplies, and some of the supplies are coming in slow, and they're not evenly distributed. So we pray for what they need for their protection and for their energy, for the strength they need to be able to continue to minister and to serve and to help those who are suffering. God, we pray for those who are grieving, who have lost loved ones. Um, they don't care about the science. They don't care about the statistics. Their world has been shattered. Their lives, their families have been torn apart. And pray for your compassion. Pray for your mercy. Pray for the healing that they need deep in their hearts, the ability in your grace to be able to continue and to move on. God, we pray for all the guys and gals that are part of the trucking industry, those who load and those who drive and those who deliver, and they, they are maxed out. Pray for the safety they need when they're tired, make mistakes. So we pray that you would give them energy and keep them alert, and that those of us who are out on the roads, we'd be respectful of what's going on and, and understand the need to get supplies delivered, and the trucking industry is doing a great job doing that. And God, we pray for it the ripple effect of what is happening. Uh, I didn't even think about that. Adoptions, people who have maybe yearned their whole lives to have a child and now it's either within their grasp and it can't happen or they're there and they can't travel back and there's a lot of stress. Uh, so God, in every area of life, we're asking that our hearts would be open to, to what you are doing. We'd be patient, we'd be filled with faith and we would trust that you are work in the midst of this challenge we're currently facing. God, help us. Help us to love one another. Help us to reach out. Help us to be sensitive to those in our own families, in our own neighborhoods, those who are right around us, that we would continue to know you, to make you known, 
be transformed into your image. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, last week we, we established and talked about the fact that God is sovereign. The, the Greek word despotes, where we get the English word despot, that he is the Lord, he is the master, he is the absolute ruler, and that he is the only one who has the character to be able to be a good, kind, loving, just, holy despot. And he is working his kingdom purposes in and for and through us, even when it seems like what is happening currently doesn't make sense to us, or we don't even like it. We say, how can you be working in this, God? Because he is sovereign, he is at work. The song that we, we uh, sing here at Caring Community, and a lot of people like, you know, the way maker, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. God is sovereign, he is at work. And the fact that he is sovereign affects our everyday life, our life decisions in every area. How we respond, what we believe about God, about his sovereignty, about his character, affects the way we live our lives. It affects what we do. It affects the decisions that we make. Now, a key characteristic that we want to talk about today, a key characteristic of his sovereignty is his omnipotence, omnipotent. He is all powerful. It is one thing for someone to identify themselves as being sovereign. He can say in the word that he's sovereign, that he's the Lord, he's the absolute ruler. But if he doesn't have the power to back it up, we don't believe it. I could stand up here and tell you till I'm blue in the face that I can fly. I could email you and tell you I can fly. I could text you and tell you I can fly. But if my feet never leave the ground, you don't believe that I can fly. I don't have the power. It's not demonstrated. God not only claims that he is sovereign, he backs it up by being all powerful. The word is omnipotent. In the Greek, it is the word pantocrator, and, and you don't care about that. But it's, it happens 10 times in the New Testament. One time it is translated as omnipotent, and the other nine times almighty. But it really means all ruling, absolute, universal, sovereign, almighty, omnipotent. So the very definition of it is included in the definition. Because when you say all powerful, it simply means all powerful. There's not much more to it than that. It is all powerful, all encapsulating. In the beginning of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, God is setting the tone to John, and Jesus identifies himself to John, the one who the revelation is being given to. And he says this in Revelation 1, 8. Jesus identifies himself and says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. Everything holds together in me, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, comma, the Pantocrator the Almighty, the Omnipotent. So that's the beginning of Revelation. In Revelation 19, at the end of Revelation, everything is coming to a close. He is pulling all of history to a close. All of his plans and purposes are going to be fulfilled exactly as he says, and this is what is heard in Revelation 19.6. John is hearing this, and, and, the, and the multitudes are declaring this. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Our Lord God omnipotent reigns. He is all-powerful. His omnipotence, his power has been displayed throughout Scripture, throughout history. So we clearly have evidence of the claim he is making. Let's go to creation. How the, the whole world is created, how it holds together. The fact that we are spinning, and we spin at the perfect angle, and if we were slower or faster, we would not survive. Everything, the way it holds together, is supernatural, a display of his power. The flood, the entire earth flooded, and yet the earth survived, and the waters went down, and the more archaeological evidence they find, the more sophisticated we are at that, the more you find the validation of this huge flood that happened very quickly, and then receded. Moses, the burning bush. God speaks to him out of a bush that's on fire, but the bush is not consumed. These are not just stories in Scripture. These things actually happen. It's part of why the Bible is under assault, why many are trying to deconstruct the Bible. They want to tell people, they're, they're just stories. It didn't really happen. No, this is the account of God's omnipotence. 
the account of his all-powerful move in the world to show us who he is. The plagues, the parting of the Red Sea. If you think of the parting of the Red Sea, historians tell us that the water where it was at that stage was probably when it was pushed back just 14 feet from floor to ceiling here at Caring Community. He said it was probably twice that high. Think about walking through a water of wall, twice that high, stories high, and you're walking on dry ground. It's, it's just immense. It's all powerful. Gideon's victory. The ladies were just doing a, a, a Zoom version of uh, the Gideon story. It says that the, the Midianites were like the sand on the seashore, and Gideon took them with 300 men. This is a display, clearly, of God's power. Daniel in the lion's den. David and his victory over Goliath. A small boy takes a rock to a sword fight, as the song that's out today says. A, 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 a supernatural victory. Joshua and his victory over Jericho. What a, what a strategy. Let's march around a city seven times. The trumpet will blast. We'll all shout, and the walls will collapse. And that's exactly what happened. They took the city of Jericho. And, of course, Jesus' power at work with his disciples feeding thousands of people with a tiny little bit of food, healing. Peter's just read it, my, my wife and I read this this week as part of our devotions. Peter's miraculous escape from prison, locked inside an inner cell with 16 guards, and the shackles fall off and the gates open, he simply walks out, actually goes to the place where the church is praying, and they're so stunned by it, at first they don't believe he's even there. The miraculous deliverance of Peter from prison. And then of course, and it's not the icing on the cake, it's the cake, the icing, it's the cherry on top, everything, is Jesus' life is a clear and total demonstration of God's power culminating in Jesus being raised from the dead. All of it, all of it, is God's kingdom purposes, his omnipotence, his power displayed so that we would be drawn to Jesus, we would be drawn to redemption through Jesus. But the display of God's power did not and does not insulate his followers from struggle, from persecution, from death. It is still a fallen world, and the end of Revelation has not happened yet. He has not come to culminate and call all of history to a close. So while he is demonstrating that he is all-powerful, the reality of this fallen world touches us, splashes all over us, affects us. We are able to deal with it because we have an eternal perspective. We have an eternal promise in the midst of the crisis and the challenge. I want to take us to a passage, an account of God displaying his omnipotence, his power. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17. It's in Old Testament. 1 Kings chapter 17. We're just going to start with verse 1, and then we're going to go backwards to part of verse 16 to give you the context of where verse 1 is coming from and why it's happening. 1 Kings 17, dot, dot, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, Ahab's king, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives... Whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Let's give a little context to this. Because of King Solomon, we have King David and his son King Solomon. King Solomon, scripture, he was the wealthiest and apart from Jesus, the wisest man who ever walked on the earth. But his heart turned because of his disobedience. He took on many foreign wives, which God told him not to do, and it was their gods, their idols, that, he, that turned his heart. And Solomon was disobedient and started to worship other gods, follow their idols, and so God ripped the kingdom from Solomon. The kingdom was split in two, two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And Israel, Israel has a run of 20 kings that spans 200 years, and it says those 20 kings over that 200 years, they were bad. They were bad. They did not honor the Lord. And King Ahab, it says, is the worst of the bunch. He's worse than all of them. And we want to pick it up, just back up into chapter 16. Let's get some context in this to just 
the description of King Ahab. First Kings 16, start with verse 29. How would you like to have this written about you? This is what's recorded about King Ahab. Just to give you some context of who Elijah is called to go to. First Kings 16, verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, that's the southern kingdom, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel in the north. And he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. So they were all bad. This, this guy's the worst. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. And he began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. In Ahab's time, Keal of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sugu, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. Yikes! That's who this guy is. He considered it trivial. He considered it cavalier. He considered it foolish to mess with God. It says he provoked God. Literally, he incited God. He literally shook his fist in God's face. There's a commercial that, that is on TV that it, it riles me every time I see it. It's Charlie. And Charlie is, Charlie is taking Delsum for his cough so that he doesn't cough. And one of the examples of how this this cough medicine works is that he he goes into this place where there is a 1200 pound Siberian tiger laying in the wide open and Charlie sneaks in with a big piece of steak and at the bottom of the screen in the commercial it says in white letters do not attempt as if anyone would do this but Charlie because he's taking Delsum he doesn't cough and so he's able to drop this steak and walk away from this tiger and it doesn't wake up but but what Ahab is doing is he's going in and poking the tiger in the eye. Just poking it. What would the tiger do? It would wake up and it would do what all cats do. It would stretch and it would stretch and then it would tear him to shreds. That's what, that's what Ahab is doing with God. He's poking God. Galatians 6 verse 7 says this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And so, so God is not going to let this go forever. But this is what Ahab is doing. He is, he is poking God. So much so that it costs other people their lives. This is a very interesting little passage here in verse 34 of, about Keal. He, he goes and it just says that he rebuilt Jericho. And if you don't know context, you think, well, why did they put that in there? Well, if you go back and look at the destruction of Jericho, Joshua, we talked about, goes around seven times, they blow the trumpet, they shout, the thing falls down, but after it is conquered, here's what it says in Joshua 6, 26. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath. Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. So there's a curse to rebuild, and Ahab goes, I don't care about the curse, I want to rebuild. And so he conscripts this guy to go rebuild Jericho. But look what happens. At the, verse 26 of Joshua 6. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. So he forces this guy to go rebuild Jericho, and it costs this guy both of his son's lives. Poke and provoke God, and eventually you have to pay the price for that. Near the end of his life, here is what's written about Ahab in 1 Kings 21, verses 25 and 26. There was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. It's one thing if you're ignorant of it, ignorant of what God wants, and you make mistakes. This guy wasn't ignorant of it. 
He was all in to do evil and to provoke the Lord. He was urged on by Jezebel, his wife. He was incited by her. He was lured by her. He was instigated by her. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. So he marries Jezebel, and she's a Baal worshiper. Her, her name literally means Baal is my husband. That's how all in she is. And he marries her for a political alliance. So Ahab is worried about wealth, about power, and about the political advantage he can get. So he marries this woman, and of course she takes a guy who's bad and makes him worse. So there is the ultimate power couple. They are the ultimate power couple, Ahab and Jezebel, and they are united for evil purposes. This is who God calls Elijah to go to. There is great risk in this challenging time. There is great risk to Elijah to go before this couple because clearly they are evil and killing comes easy to them. So Elijah walks in to this setting. Why does he do it? Let's go back to verse 1 because verse 1 is crucial. I want to tell you, if you don't hear anything else in this message, pay attention to verse 1. Because this is crucial for Elijah. It is crucial for us in living the rest of our lives. 1 Kings 17, back to verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite, look what he's walking into. From Tishbe and Gilead, said to Ahab. He presents himself before Ahab. His life is on the line. He says, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither, neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Elijah's name means Yahweh is God. My God is Jehovah. And it says, whom I serve. And in the Hebrew, there's a very interesting phrase. In the, in the King James and in the New King James, whom I serve is translated, before whom I stand. And I think that's a little bit better translation, but in the Hebrew, it gives us the sense of it. Before whom I stand or whom I serve, that phrase is two words in the Hebrew. Penaim Ahmad. Penaim Ahmad. You want to remember that because this guides us the rest of our lives and it guides Elijah. Penaim means face, face to face, in intimate relationship with God, in an intimate known relationship. Elijah says, I am Elijah and I penayim. I have an intimate relationship with God. And the other part is a mob, which means to stand, to remain, to endure, to take one stand, to be rooted on holy ground. So as Elijah walks into Ahab, he says, you're the king. You think you're in control, but I have a relationship, an intimate relationship with God. And I have taken my stand. I have rooted myself there. And it's from that relationship and that perspective I'm speaking to you now. Can I submit to you that that's the place God has called us? It is from that place of Penayim Ahmad, intimate relationship that we have rooted our lives in, that we interact and we share and we minister to the society around us. No matter what the cost is, no matter what the danger is, no matter what we face. So where does this idea of no rain for the next year, you, few years come from. If Elijah doesn't cook this up on his own. It comes from Payim Ahmad. It comes from his intimacy with God. He walks face to face with God, and that is key. And it's from the relationship that God says, take this step, go here, say this. And it's the same for us. It is based on our relationship with God that he says, I want you to share this. I want you to move here. Take this job. Don't do this. Move here. Go wherever he tells us to go. It is based on Penayim Ahmad, an intimate relationship with God where we have taken our stand and rooted our entire lives in that relationship. James 5.17 says Elijah's not special. James 5.17, Elijah was a human being even as we are, just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. It's powerful stuff. Who controls the rain? Who stops the rain? God. But Elijah is just like us. It means same passion, 
same suffering, same feelings, same challenges, same opportunities as us. But he walks in it based upon his relationship with God, that that's what he has rooted himself in. And what God asks him to do, what he tells him to do, what he shows him to do, that's what he does. Now this is a, this is a direct challenge to Ahab's idolatry. The pagan god, Baal. Baal was worshipped as the god of the weather, the god of harvest, the god of provision. And so God is sending Elijah in and saying, you think you're in charge? You think Baal's in charge? God is going to show him through Elijah, I'm going to show you just how weak Baal is. It's not going to rain for the next few years. It turns out to be three and a half years. Go to Baal, cry out to Baal, see how you make out. God was sending Elijah to declare and to show that God is all-powerful. He was showing God's omnipotence, his absolute control. So let's pick it up. From that place of Penaim Ahmad, Elijah walks in. Let's pick it up in verse 2 and see how this starts to unfold. We see the all-powerful move of God. 1 Kings 17, verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Whew, that's awesome. Elijah is walking in God's kingdom purposes. And when we walk in God's assignment in his kingdom purposes, then God enforces what he's asking us to do by showing his power. It comes with God's power. And this is supernatural. We were sitting and we're starting to see the birds come. We sit in the back room in our townhouse and we're starting to see the birds coming in the trees. I'm not seeing any of them bring me dinner. None of them are bringing me dinner. I, we, God has provided for us, and we can go to the grocery store and buy it. But that wasn't available to Elijah, but God still provided supernaturally, and he drinks from a ravine. This is God's power at work. The question is, do we believe it? Do we believe that God is still doing that? That he's still moving supernaturally? I was reflecting on this and looking back over the course of Caring Community Church. We started in 1991. Next year will be 30 years. And back then, and still to this day, one of the biggest challenges in planning a church and starting a church from scratch is finding a location. That's one of the big deals. You've got to find a location about where you're going to be able to meet. And you meet in all kinds of different places, and depending on where you meet it, they create their own set of challenges. Some people meet in movie theaters, and you've got to pack up and move out and shut down because the movies are going to start. So a lot of different challenges so we're at the beginning of this, and we're out in Finley, Ohio, and think about planning a church, and we have no idea what we're doing. So we drive into Pennsylvania, and we simply pray. And Beth and I are driving through central Pennsylvania, driving, and we're, we're, we're coming into Hershey. And God just downloads that this is the, this is the place. Hershey is the place to, to plant a church. And so we got we to gotta actually stop and process this a little bit and think about it, and how are you going to do that except over a cup of coffee, right? And so we're coming down 322, and this is so long ago that as you come down 322 from Harrisburg into Hershey, you could still go in the left lane and make a left-hand turn into what's now Haas's. Do you remember that? Okay, there were so many accidents there that they changed it. You can't do it anymore, but you still could then. And so God is telling us Hershey's this place to plant a church. And so we pull in the left lane, we make a left and go in, but it wasn't Haas's then. Back then it was a place called Sandry's. It was a restaurant and banquet hall. And so we go in just to get a cup of coffee. We have no idea what we're doing. No idea how to plant a church. No, all we do is go, I think God's calling us to do this. And we're praying. And so we sit down at the counter and Keith Cole walks out. We don't know he's Keith Cole at the time. Just met this guy, walks out. He goes, what can I get you? We'd just like to have some coffee. So he pours us coffee and we're drinking coffee. And he comes back out to refresh us and say, how you guys doing? We go, um... Have you ever thought about letting a church meet here? And he's, I mean, this is like 
just minutes. He's holding the coffee pot in his hand. He goes, I never did, but okay. And then we had a location. And that is where Caring Community started. We started in November of 1991 in the banquet hall of Sandry's Restaurant. And God provided super, I mean, we didn't, we didn't even know what not to ask. He let us meet there from there. We were only there in November, December. They sold a mortgage out from under him. He came to us. We only been there a couple of weeks. He says, you got to move. They sold a mortgage out from under me. I'm, I'm losing the place. Now what? We pray. My wife is looking through the phone book about places to rent. How do we, what, what do we do? Union Deposit Fire Hall? Fire Company? That doesn't make any sense. Called him up. Hey, do you think you'd let a church meet there? Never thought about it. Sure. And so we moved to Union Deposit Fire Hall and met in a fire hall with the fire trucks going in and out. Just crazy stories on and on and on and on and on about God's miraculous provision, his power at work as you walk in his kingdom purposes, his agenda. It's not God's power just, to sh just so we get to say, oh, God did just cool thing. It is God's power for kingdom purposes that we would know God, that we would make him known, be transformed into his image. So that's what Elijah is walking in, and God is supernaturally providing. Let's pick up the story in verse 7, because it seems to take a very weird twist. Verse 7, 1 Kings 17. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Well, no kidding. That's what Elijah said was going to happen, right? There's going to be no rain, so it dried up. But... But God, I'm the one that did what you wanted me to do, so you got to still provide for me, right? I don't like the where this is going. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. All right. I, this is frustrating. Here you are doing what God has asked you to do. Walking in obedience. And now there's no provision. Now the, the brook has dried up. I mean, you've been feeding me supernaturally. What, do the birds not want to obey anymore? Can't you do this, God? What is going on here? You ever ask those questions? Jesus said in John 16, 33. Jesus said, I have told you these things. This is near the end when he is gonna, when he's going to be crucified. And he says, you're going to be scattered. All of you are going to be scattered, and it is going to be a very hard time. He goes, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You're going to have my presence in the midst of hard times. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. Have courage. I have overcome the world. Hard times are going to happen, and Jesus says you are not going to be insulated from them. They'll happen to you too. But but take heart because God is working in and through them. He is at work in the hard times. What happens is we cooperate by taking steps of obedient, dependent faith, and God continues to supply. But it's not always easy. But he is always at work. He's got a kingdom purpose. He's making this happen because he is sending Elijah to Zarephath. There's a kingdom agenda at work here. Zarephath is in enemy territory. Zarephath is the hometown of Jezebel. All right, so it is like the center of Baal worship. And he's going, what? You, you, you can't take care of me someplace safe? Someplace in Israel? No, God is sending him there specifically because God has a kingdom agenda at work even in the midst of the hard times. Ahab provokes God. Elijah obeys and trusts him. And God is calling him for kingdom purposes to walk into enemy territory. Who will we go to? Maybe the better question is, who will we not go to? Will we go to enemy territory? 
who is who's that enemy? It may be someone on the other side of the world. It might be someone on, well, you're not at work. Everybody's sequestered home, so it's not that co-worker. You don't have to deal with them now, at least not for now. Maybe it's them. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe the enemy is a virus. Will you, will you minister in the midst of the virus? Last night, I was sitting in my office, my office faces the front of the cul-de-sac where we park, and Beth was in the living room, and, and it caught a corner of my ambulance came in. The Lifeline white ambulance from the med center. The lights weren't flashing. It was raining and raw and cold. And the Lifeline, I said, hey, the, the ambulance just came in. And Beth, Beth got a raincoat on. She walked out to the end of the sidewalk and looked. She said, well, it looks like they're parking down there, but the lights aren't on, so she came back in. Now, it's last night, it's in the 40s, and it's raining, and it's raw. So, as a Christian, as a believer, it's like, well, let's pray for what's going on. So we did. Held hands, Lord, whatever's going on, whatever, whoever's being, you know, just give these EMTs protection and wisdom and bring life and protect life. Amen. Good. We do what we're supposed to. Except God's go, go find out what's going on. What? Well, we pray. We do what we're supposed to. I don't want to. You know when God impresses on you. So I grab my umbrella and I walk down to the end of the cul-de-sac and it's in one of the units. It actually is the unit of a couple where the husband has been here. He attended our last service of the shadows. He was here. And his wife is an invalid. She's in a wheelchair. And so it was her. I went up and I, and I said, hey, you know, I mean, the EMTs, they got the masks on, the shit, but they got the whole thing, and rightly so, they need to be protected. I woke up with my umbrella. So, it's, so what's happening? Well, she's sort of like maybe flu-like symptoms, not really sure what's going on, and so they're going to assess her and find out what's going on. Holy Spirit, pray, pray with them, pray for her. So he's standing right next to me. I put my hand on his shoulder. I pray for him. I'm holding my umbrella. Pray for him. He's really appreciative. Just pray the things, you know, God's care and God's love. Amen. He says, thank you, and he sticks his hand out. See my hand. What do you do? You shake his hand. I don't go, well, I want to pray all of God's power into this situation, except it's not powerful to cover me shaking your hand. No. Shake his hand and come home to bed. No. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about being cavalier. I'm not talking about being reckless. There's not a cell in my body, a cell in my brain that wants a coronavirus. I don't want it. I don't want to pass it to anyone. I don't want anyone else to have it. I don't want to get it. But the point is, when God calls you to go minister, whatever you're stepping into, we are trusting his power in the midst of this. When I came home, I went to the sink and I washed my hands. Okay, I washed them and, you know. But who is greater? What enemy will we not go to? God calls Elijah to go to enemy territory for kingdom purposes. Let's pick it up in verse 10. So he went, 1 Kings 17, verse 10. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called, her, he called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And, and bring me, please, a, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. All right, and understand, he is in enemy territory. This woman, this widow, is a Phoenician. So she believes in many gods, small g. She believes in lots of gods. 
And so Elijah comes. She, of course, because you believe in many gods, Elijah's got a God too. And so she says, I don't know about your God, and I don't know about my gods. We have all these gods, but what I can tell you is none of them have any power because we're in a drought, and I have this little bit of food left. I'm going to make a meal, and we're all going to die. So I don't care about your God. I don't care about my gods. We all have gods. None of them work, is what she's saying. Many times, God has to get us to the end of every other answer, every other God, small g, every other thing that we think works, that we try to make the answer. So what, what gods, small g, what gods is the God after in your life? What gods need to go? What gods are demonstrating their weakness in your life? You've been chasing them and following them and pursuing them, and, and they're not providing what you thought they would provide. And in this time, God is showing the weakness of the God small g that we have put so much faith in. And Elijah comes on behalf of the God, Yahweh, Jehovah, the existing one, to challenge her and to show her there is a God, the God who is all-powerful. Let's pick it up in verse 13. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Boy, do people need to hear that today. Everywhere we go, we can declare because of the truth we have, because of Panaim Ahmad, we can be declare, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the Lord gives rain on the land. She has a decision to make. And that's when it's back, back in verse 9 when, she, when, when God says, I have commanded her, this is the move of the Holy Spirit. She doesn't, even, she doesn't even know Yahweh. She doesn't even know Jehovah. But there's something in her moving her to take this step of faith. And it is really the, it is the prefiguring of the, of the move of the Holy Spirit that we have in all of us as believers and the move of the Holy Spirit when we are doing ministry in the world. Same thing is happening here. She has not had an aha moment yet. But she went away, verse 15, and did as Elijah had told her. God's at work. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word, the Lord, the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. All right, we're rolling now. We've got more miraculous provision, miraculous supply. Now we can wait this thing out. Right? We're going to just hunker down. We're going to wait until it rains, until the crisis is over. We got oil. We got food. We got enough toilet paper. We're ready to go. But God knows what's needed. She has not come around yet. She's happy for the supply, but she still doesn't know the one, Yahweh, who it came from. He is still working his plans and purposes. Let's look at verses 17 to 24. I'd be happy with, hey, we just got a word. We got food. Let's wait this thing out, right? Let's just be safe. But God's at work. Verse 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse. And finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come and remind me of my sin and kill my son? In other words, I don't know about all these gods, but it's your God's fault. It's your fault. We're hearing a lot of that too. Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord. 
O Lord, my God, you have brought tragedy also upon this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die. Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down to the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then, then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know. Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth, is the truth. See, God knew that the Phoenician woman was not convinced that he is the God above all gods. God's heart is that none should perish. So he is still working. Inside the front page of the bulletin that we print out every week here at Caring Community, inside the front page at the bottom is this verse, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. A companion verse in the Old Testament is Ezekiel 18.32, where God says through the prophet Ezekiel, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn. Change your way of thinking. Change your course of pursuit and live. So God causes her son to die. Then raises him back up again. And Elijah gets to be part of God's omnipotence. Why? For kingdom purposes. For kingdom purposes. And what's the purpose? That she would know. That she would know God. The word know there is the Hebrew word yada. To know, to perceive and see, to find out, to distinguish. She needs to distinguish between Yahweh and all these other gods, small g. And now she knows, she decides to know by experience, to recognize, to confess, to decide for yourself. It's the same word that Satan uses with Eve when he tempts her in Genesis 3 and says, you don't have to follow God, you can yada. You can decide for yourself good and evil. Everyone has to yada. Everyone has to decide for themselves what it is they believe, who God is. And because of God's passion for the lost, he sends Elijah to enemy territory, demonstrates that he is all-powerful, and she knows. She decides he is the one true God. She says, this God, Jehovah, is the true God. What he says is true. It is faithful. It is true. It is sure. It is reliable. It is stable. Now, there's something important we need to know about this. This widow and her son will eventually die. They don't, they, they, they'll eventually die. He, God worked a miraculous, powerful move so that she would see his glory and his power, but they eventually die. It won't be long until Elijah is taken up into heaven. At the end of 1 Kings, Ahab and Jezebel, they die. The issue is, do they know God? Elijah knows. The widow knows. Ahab and Jezebel, they do not. All of them die. You see, we have to have an eternal perspective. Do, do I want to die? No. Do I want to get coronavirus? No. Am I prepared for it? Yes. Why? Eternal perspective. Because I know. I know who God is, who I am in him because of Jesus. God is still doing that. He is still working his power. We are part of his omnipotent move when we are walking in his kingdom purposes so people would know. One of the places that we are privileged to be part of where people come to know is at our church camp. Our church camp has not been insulated from this virus. Groups are canceling 
coming up to camp. You're not supposed to meet in small groups, so they've been canceling their meetings, and it's, it's created a financial burden on our church camp. It leaves them short in their operating expenses. So how does God do that when we're trying to walk in his purposes? Well, a believer, though we don't know who it is, a believer dies. A believer is now with the Lord, but in that believer's estate, money is set aside to go to camp. And so God calls this person home at just the right time that a state is settled. And when the coronavirus hits and camp can't meet their expenses, this estate comes in and it's going to fund about eight weeks worth of operating expenses for camp. Why? Kingdom purposes. Because God is showing his power. He's doing this over and over and over again. And it all flows from Penayim Amad. Do you know God? Are you in an intimate relationship with him? You can only have that. You can only have Panaim Ahmad through and because of Jesus. His omnipotent power over sin and death. He died on the cross for us, then rose again from the grave, validated and victorious, taking the wages of sin and death, which is our destruction. There are the wages paid in full, we marked. Paid in full. That's why I know. It's not because I'm a preacher. I know because I accepted Jesus. I accepted Jesus, and so my wage for my sin is paid in full by Jesus. He wants that for you too. Now you may recognize God's power all around you. Recognizing his power is not the same as surrendering your life to Jesus. His power only enters into you when you accept him as your personal savior. Then you know him. In Ephesians 1, verses 18 to 20, God's word says this. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That's those who have accepted Jesus, who believe in Jesus as their Savior. If you don't believe, that incomparably great power is at work, but it's not at work in you. It's at work trying to draw you to him. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realm. Jesus himself says in John 14, 6, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you are listening out here this morning and you have not done that, you have God's small g that you have invested your life in, and you're sitting there and you know right now the Holy Spirit is impressing on you that they don't have that power. They have not, they have not been as advertised. Today is the day. Now would be the time for you to put your faith in Christ. It is a simple prayer Say, Lord, I've been investing my life in the wrong things. Maybe you have shaken your fist at God, and maybe you have just ignored him. But either way, he is showing his power to you today through his word, through the Holy Spirit touching your heart. You ask him into your life. Say, Lord, I accept your payment as paid in full for my life. I accept you as my Savior, and I strive now through the empowering of your spirit to make you Lord of my life. If you do that, Right now, if you pray that, you are saved. His power coming into you through the Holy Spirit. Your sin is paid for in full, and he is demonstrating his omnipotent power to and in you. For all of us who do believe, who have done that, look for his omnipotence in everyday life. He is still at work. Look for it to be part of it. Expect it. Expect to be part of his move for his kingdom purposes. Our devotions, Beth and my devotions this morning, Beth came and she said, I didn't get to do mine yet. She came and she said, you got to read this verse to close. So I'll use this as a, a closing verse. It came about out of our devotions, which she read and I will. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14, Paul writes to the church, and he says this, no matter what crisis you're facing, what enemy you're facing, what time it is, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. 
Be people of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. And so I looked that up real quick this morning. Here's the beautiful part of it. The be on your guard. The stand firm in faith. Be a certain people, a people of courage. That's all active voice. Those are the steps of faith we take. And then it says, be strong. The be strong is passive voice. It's what God does to us. It's his omnipotent power. You take the steps of faith and follow me, and I will, I will inject my omnipotent power into your life and carry you along. Do it all in love. Penayim Ahmad. The face-to-face -face intimate relationship with God. He's still working. Let's be part of it. Amen? And amen. Let's pray. God, thank you. I pray for any who are out there that just made that decision that they recognize they desperately wanted Penayim Ahmad to be face-to-face -face in relationship with you of intimacy and for your power to guide and, and, and rule their lives. Pray you would encourage them and if they're not part of a church or caring or whatever they are, that when this breaks and we're able to meet again, that they would be part of a fellowship that loves you, that loves your word, that declares your word, and will help them grow in, in the relationship they have with you. But for all of us, Lord, for all of us who are listening, who have that relationship, let us not fall prey to westernizing what is happening that we only believe in things we can see with our eyes, taste with our tongues, feel with our hands, but that we recognize you are moving in a powerful way and you invite us into that and it, and it cannot be explained in any other terms than the omnipotence of a sovereign God, that you are at work. We thank you for it, Lord, that we can be Panayimama. We can take our stand, we can root ourselves in an intimate, loving relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.